All right, so for this particular um, lesson, uh, I want to just kind of focus on uh, the actual like hearts themselves. As I said, I have, I've got a few that were dissected that I'm going to show uh, multiple perspectives of. Um, and again, since, you know, for my students uh, in the uh, online platform, since we can't obviously do this in person, this is the best way I can think of to actually bring this, this dissection in this lab to you. So, um, so yeah, so this here is a uh, large, this is a pig heart here. Um, the hearts, so I'm actually borrowing this heart from a colleague. The hearts I normally use are sheep hearts because they're, uh, you know, closer to human size. Uh, but the nice thing, but the, the reason why I want this heart for the exterior is because uh, much of the exterior was left intact. So um, that's what I want to go over there. So this is an anterior view of, oops, sorry, this is an, sorry, I'm still getting used to using these document cameras. So this is an anterior view of the heart itself, um, similar to what you saw on the model. Um, you know, much of the right atrium is on the anterior side. So in the previous video, I stated that the atria are kind of like these flap-like sacs that reside on the superior aspect of the heart. So this would be the right atrium, and that would be the oracle of the right atrium. And then this would be the left atrium, which again, you can see most of it's on the posterior side. And then the extension would be the auricle itself as well, okay? Um, and then all of this down here, all of this meat, that is, these are the ventricles. So right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle, okay? Um, and then remember when you're looking at the heart from an anterior perspective as well, Remember, since, since the right ventricle is mostly anterior itself, um, you see the pulmonary trunk, which is what, it, which is what is connected to the right ventricle, which is what uh, distributes blood into the, well, begins distributing blood into the pulmonary circuit. Remember, the base of the pulmonary trunk is anterior to the base of the aorta, which you can see right here. So this would be the pulmonary trunk. That would be the base of the aorta right there. Now, again, you can see, however, that as I mentioned in the previous uh, video, that the aorta is a much larger artery than the pulmonary trunk. So um, going back to what I said, if you look at the thickness of the wall, that's called the tunica media of the aorta, it's very, very thick, okay? And if uh, I didn't want to cut the pulmonary trunk open, because like I said, this is not a heart, I'm, I'm, uh, this is not you know, my heart, but if we were to do the same thing, if we were to cut this, in, if we were to cross-section this, and then look at the, uh, the, the, the thickness of the pulmonary trunk, it would be thinner than that of the aorta. So that's kind of something to keep in mind if you were to see these cut, okay? Um, and then, uh, now remember, normally, because this uh, this heart came out of a quadruped, um, notice how the pulmonary trunk um, doesn't really ascend that much before it already starts arching and then the bifurcating pulmonary arteries, because remember, in us humans, the pulmonary trunk ascends and then bifurcates, um, and then pulmonary arteries go, um, you know, go to each pulmonary circuit. The right pulmonary artery goes under the aortic arch and the left just goes straight to the left lung, okay? So, so you can see right here, we've got the aorta, and that's the ascending aorta. Then the aorta arches, and then it would, uh, and then it would descend down the posterior side of the heart on the way down to the abdomen. Okay. Um, so again, that is the right atrium. That's the right ventricle. That is the left atrium. That is the left ventricle. Okay. And there's the pulmonary trunk, and there is the aorta. You know, and if we flip this around and look at it from a posterior perspective you can again see the um you know the right atrium the left atrium left ventricle and the right ventricle all right exactly they cut this okay all right so they cut this in a way so you can see the left ventricle quite well but the right is not quite as exposed so we're just gonna leave that be um all right, I'll tell you what, folks, when you're looking at a heart and you're trying to understand the anatomy of the heart, these little dull probes are really useful, especially when trying to track blood flow through the heart. You know, because, for example, um, you know, if you're trying to figure out, okay, well, where does the, um, you know, like, where does the... Uh, uh, like how would blood exit? So right here. So for example, this is the the posterior. This is the left ventricle right here. And then if you were to run this through, you can see how that probe would come right out the aorta right there. All right. Um, so it's kind of this is always a useful little tool to have on hand. All right. Um, you see the pulmonary valve? We look down. Uh, not really very well. So 
I'm trying to see if you can get the pulmonary valve, but not, or aortic valve, I'm sorry, but not very well. So, okay, so this is just kind of an undissected, and, and remember this down here would be the uh, apex of the heart, which no, under normal circumstances would uh, tend to, to tilt or deviate to the left. Okay, so apex left, left ventricle, left atrium, right atrium, right ventricle. Okay, now I'm gonna move next to um, some sheep hearts that were uh, that I actually used for my class. And I've got three different ones that I had cut open that we're going to take a look at. Um, all right, so now because I kind of in a pinch for time on this, I didn't really cut the fat off because you know normally hearts have some uh, adipose tissue around the outsides of them, which uh, plays an integral role in you know uh, you know energy and cushioning of the heart. Um, this is an anterior view of the heart. And then this is a posterior view. Okay, now let me let, let let's let's open this thing up and then look at the inside of it. So remember, this is an anterior view of the heart. This is a coronal cut that was made, and then now we've got the inside exposed. All right. Now, in the previous video that I made on heart models, uh, I said that, and I say this in my classes all the time as well. Um, it, it is imperative, and I can't emphasize enough on how important this is that before you ever jump to identifying parts of the heart, know how you're looking at it. Okay, know how you're looking at this thing. Because as I mentioned before, and I, something I just repeat constantly, if you mix up the left versus the right side, you're gonna get everything wrong. And I don't wanna see that happen to anybody, whether you're my student or a student that's watching this to help yourself study. Okay, so remember that this was a, a this is a three-dimensional object that we use the coronal plane to divide, okay? So this is the um, this is the posterior side. This is the anterior side, as you, as you saw how I flipped it around. Now, getting the left and right sorted out on a di on a dissected heart is very very simple if you just do this one little thing. Okay, so let's get our let, let, let's let's identify the chambers first. Okay, so um, so here is the IV septum, the interventricular septum. Remember in the previous video I said that's a muscular septum that that divides the right and left ventricles from one another to prevent for for two purposes. One to prevent the mixing of blood between the two chambers because we don't want higher and lower oxygenated blood mixing together, and B, we don't want one chamber ejecting more blood than the other. They need to be an equal output by both. So that septum ensures that both of those situations will occur. All right, now, so this is the IV septum, and then the hollow area on each side of it are the ventricles, okay? Now, what you want to do is look at the lateral wall of each ventricle, okay? The lateral wall of each ventricle, because again, this is the IV septum, and these are the lateral walls of each ventricle. All right. Um, note, you'll notice there is a discernible difference in thickness between one side or the other, okay? If you look at this and you just simply say, if you look at, if you look at this and you see, notice how one side is about three times more thick than the other side. Just look at that and say, this side is thicker, that's the left side of the heart. As simple as that. So if you know that the thicker side is the left side, then okay, well there's the left ventricle. The left atrium would be the superior side. And the thinner side, well there's the right ventricle, and there's the all that fatty tissue, there's part of the right right atrium right there. Okay. Um, it's it's as simple as that, folks. Because remember, so remember, this is an anterior view. I so remember this is the right, that's the left side. You see, hopefully you're getting the gist of this. When I flip this over, you see how the right side now flipped over when I get, even though this is still an an, the anterior side of the heart. Okay. So the thicker side is the left side. The the thinner side is the right side. When I'm talking about the ventricles, now let's talk about why. So going back to what I said earlier is that the output of blood from each ventricle must match one another. So the respective circuits that they pump blood into uh, does not get overloaded and cause uh, uh, which will eventually cause edema if that has, uh, and, uh, and many other complications that follow because of that. Now. Remember, the right ventricle is is connected to the pulmonary trunk, and the right ventricle is what, which is again buried in all this fat here. Sorry, guys. Um, but uh, the right ventricle is what ejects blood into the pulmonary trunk, and the right ventricle um, is, it, it pumps blood into the pulmonary circuit. Okay, so in saying that. Um, 
The right ventricle pumps blood into the pulmonary circuit. The left ventricle pumps blood or ejects blood into the systemic circuit. Okay, the pulmonary circuit is much smaller than the systemic circuit. The right ventricle has to generate enough force to get blood out of itself and then into the, into the lungs, the pulmonary circuit. The left ventricle has to generate enough pressure to get blood into the systemic circuit, which is significantly more massive compared to the pulmonary circuit. There are far more blood vessels. And one thing that you have that, that you learn about more when we get to the next chapter on uh, like blood pressure hemodynamics and stuff like that is there is something called peripheral resistance. Resistance, um, there are factors in the, in, in the circuits, in blood vessels, that work against the flow of blood. And the, it's the ventricle's responsibility to generate enough force to overcome the resistance uh, so blood can flow. So another way to put that is the ventricles have to generate enough bl pressure, blood pressure, to get blood to flow through those, the, the pulmonary systemic circuits against the peripheral resistive factors that work against blood flow. Since there are so many more blood vessels in the systemic circuit than there are in the pulmonary circuit, in order for the left ventricle to keep up or have an equal output to the right, it has to work a heck of a lot harder. All right, um, and plus the pulmonary circuit is a very low resistance circuit anyway. So, the, so in order for the right ventricle to eject on average five liters of blood per rest or five liters of blood at rest per minute, um, you know, it, it, there's not there's not as big of an effort required relative to the left ventricle. So the left ventricle has to kick out an equal volume every minute to keep up with the right. And through a much larger circuit with more blood vessels that resist blood flow, so that's why the muscle tissue, uh, the uh, the myocardium on the uh, uh, the lateral wall, the left ventricle, is so much more thick. Because remember, at the molecular level, there are a lot of parallels between how cardiac and skeletal muscle work, and. You know, in a similar fashion to skeletal muscle, when, you, know, you know that when you work skeletal muscle, like if you lift weights and pump iron, your muscles will get bigger and stronger. Same concept with the heart. The harder this muscle tissue works, the bigger and stronger the muscle cells will become. Okay? Um, and again, kind of over, oversimplified that, but it's just doing that intentionally so you can get the gist. All right? So the thicker side is the left side. The thinner side is the right side. Always start there. I can't emphasize enough on the importance of that. Always start there. Thick side, left side, thin side, right side. Simple as that. And then in, in the middle, we've got the interventricular septum. Okay. Now, you can then see if we, uh, so again, this is the thick side. That is the left ventricle here. And actually, if we tilt this a little bit, we can see that we're looking up into the left atrium right here. And you'll notice the very rigid design, the design of, the, oops, of the left atrium there. Those are called pectinate muscles, which are very similar to the trabeculae carniae that I mentioned in the previous video. Um, I'll come back to those in a moment. Okay. Now, um, remember that there are two types of valves within the heart. There are AV valves and semilunar valves. Remember, AV stands for atrioventricular, valves between the atria and the ventricles. And remember, the purpose of a valve, promoting one-way or unidirectional flow by preventing backflow or retrograde flow. So, so these valves ensure that blood flows in one fluid direction and doesn't go in reverse. All right, so when the valve opens, the, when a valve opens, it permits the flow through. When the valve closes, then that prevents blood from going back through it and allows it to only go in the, the direction of the next opening, which would then be at the, the, which would be the great arteries that the ventricles are attached to. Okay, so, so again, if we say that this is the left side of the heart and that's the left ventricle and that's the left atrium, then remember, this is the mitral valve or the bicuspid valve that is between each of these. So a little review here for a moment. Bicuspid, it has two cusps. Here's one cusp, here's the other cusp, and then here's part of the other one that's, that, that was cut in half there. And then it's also called the mitral valve. Um, you know, and you know, this I usually ask, you know, well, why is it called the mitral valve? And um, usually, you know, I ask you know, my students, you know, who, you know, I usually ask who's Catholic in the room, and then I ask them, okay, well, what do you call that the, 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 that tall hat that the Pope wears? And um, then we talk about that a little bit. It's called a mitre. Anatomists, the very long time ago, uh, and I think it was a, a, a good um, analogy that they made, thought that the mitral valve looked a lot like the Pope's mitre, so therefore uh, they call it the mitral valve. And, you know, well, Google it. Look it up. You'll see, the, you'll see the parallel between the two. Okay. But again, anatomically, we could call it the bicuspid valve because it has two cusps. Okay. 
Now, remember that the mitral valve, along with the tricuspid valve, which we'll look at in a moment, have chordae tendinae, which you can see right here, these tendinous cords that attach to these bumps of muscle called papillary muscle, or papillary bump. So a little, little side note on here, the country, the country music industry has made billions of dollars off of chordae tendinae. If you know what I'm talking about, you know, they've written a lot of songs about tugging on your heartstrings. You know, so yeah, so that's what we generically classify as heart strings. So go home and tell your significant other that they tug on their on your chordae tendine and then watch their frontalis muscle contract in confusion if they don't know this stuff. So, but yeah, it's fun. The more you know this stuff, you know, mess with people a little bit. It's, it's a good thing to do. So, um, all right. So basically, these are chordae tendine that attach to papillary muscles. And then remember, I also said down in the ventricles there are these independent beams of muscle that are called trabeculae carniae. Remember, trabeculae means little beam and carniae like meat, you know. So basically with these, remember I said in the previous video, these help to increase the pumping power of the ventricles from the inside. So on the lateral or outside walls of the ventricle, uh, ventricles, I'm sorry, and remember the IV septum is also myocardium, so it will also contract. Um, remember that when the, remember the word contract means to shorten, right? So when the ventricles contract and they begin to shorten or squeeze against the blood within them, that increases the amount of pressure against blood, which causes it to be pushed up and out. Because remember, I said in previous lectures that the ventricles are ejecting chambers of the heart, okay? So the myocardium on the outside of the ventricles increases the pumping power from the outside. When trabeculae carniae contract from the inside, that pulls the ventricles together even with more strength. Because the thing is, we want these ventricles to contract with as much force as possible because A, they have to work against gravity to get blood up and out, and B, we need to make sure there's enough blood pressure and force to get blood to actually move through the circuit so it can return back to the heart and we keep it pumping and keep our vital organs alive. All right. And remember, trabeculae carniae do not have uh, uh, chordae tendinae or cords attached to them. If you see a bump of muscle and a chordae tendinae attached to it, that's a papillary muscle. If you see these ridges or um, beams of, of muscle without cords attached to them, trabeculae carniae or pectinate muscles up there, okay, in the atria. Okay, so that is the left side of the heart. And also remember that the left ventricle, when it contracts, it pumps blood up into the aorta, which will then begin to distribute blood into the systemic circuit. All right, and this is part of the aorta. Sort of a right now. It was cut pretty bad, so let's see if I can get on this side. There we are, it's better. So here, Remember, there are semilunar valves at the bases of each great artery. So again, that's the left ventricle right there. You can see all these trabeculae carniae inside of inside of the left ventricle. Okay, and then you see a papillary muscle right there, and then you see the chordae tendinae and part of the mitral valve. And then um, here is one of the cusps of the aortic valve. Um, remember, that's a semilunar valve that prevents blood from falling back into the ventricles when the ventricles uh, go back into a state of uh, diastole or relaxation. Okay. Okay, so that's the left side. And also notice when you look at this, there's kind of this, this kind of glossy appearance on the inside of the ventricle. Remember, that would be the endocardium, the serous membrane, the simple squamous epithelium that lines the inside of the heart. This is the myocardium, the muscle tissue that, the, that performs the pumping action. And then the epicardium is just an ever so thin, um, again, you know, serous membrane on the very outside of the heart as well, okay? And then if we go to the other side, we have the right ventricle right here. So again, you can see how that muscular septum divides both sides. I'm pushing on it right now, okay? And you can see there's the right ventricle. What that is right there, that's the moderator band that acts as an electrical conduit. I'll talk more about that when we get to the physiology side of things here. And then again, you can see the cusps of the tricuspid valve. Okay, so you can see, so there's a cusp. There's a cusp. And then, sorry, I'm trying to get the cords there. All right, let's see if I can get them better on this side. Okay, there we go, that's better. All right. So you can see right there that there, um, there's that right ventricle with a much thinner, thinner lateral wall. Um, you can see the trabeculae carniae down in the, uh, in the ventricles there. And you can see the components of the tricuspid valve and the chordae tendinae as they attach to papillary muscles there. Okay. And then again, you can see up into the right atrium there as well. Okay. 
Um, and then, you know, also, again, when I talk about that process of blood flow through the heart, this will help you better understand that when we're talking about, you know, blood, you know, circulating through the heart and how it goes from less to more oxygenated as it cycles through the circuits. Okay, because remember, less oxygenated blood enters the right atrium from the superior inferior vena cava and coronary sinus. It then flows down through the uh, tricuspid valve into the right ventricle and then out of the right ventricle through the pulmonary trunk. And then uh, the pulmonary trunk bifurcates into pul uh, pulmonary arteries, which distribute both of the pulmonary circuit. Remember, gas exchange, O2 in, o the CO2 out. Then that blood returns back to the left atrium via pulmonary veins. Blood will then flow down through the mitral valve into the, the, the left ventricle, and then that blood will be ejected out of the left ventricle through the aortic valve, out the aorta to the systemic circuits, again for gas exchange, but the opposite, O2 out of the blood and CO2 in. Okay, so like I'm saying, as, as you start naming these parts off as you're going through this process, and heck, it doesn't even hurt to like draw this out as you're doing it, you know, like if you were to just, you know, if you were to just kind of draw a heart out, you know, then let's say you got some atria, you got ventricles, and so on. You know, that's a good, you know, you can kind of diagram that, you know, as you're, you know, kind of thinking about that as well. Just kind of some, and I just got, you know, heart all over my Sharpie there, so that was smart, Aaron. So, all right, but, but again, that's just one example of a heart. Let me show you a couple more um, as, as we overview this. Now again, these also don't look pretty because I uh, also ordered these in vacuum sealed bags. They need to start ordering them in buckets. Um, okay, so again, we've got an anterior view of the heart, pulmonary trunk, aorta right there, uh, right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. Okay, so let's flop that open. Again, anterior view, pulmonary trunk, aorta, left atrium, right atrium, left ventricle, right ventricle. No, oh, apex. Okay. So now again, I'm going to just have you pause for a moment and look at this. And I want you to look, let's look at the hearts on this side, and then look at the hearts on that side. Take a moment to think to yourself, and again, the first thing you should do is identify the right and the left side. I'll give you just a brief moment to do that. Which side is left and which side is right? Okay, remember, what was that mental note I told you guys to make? Look at the lateral side of each heart, right? The lateral side, look at the lateral sides, okay? Because remember, this in the middle is the IV septum, okay? So notice how this side is significantly thicker than this side. So this side would be the right, and this side would be the left. And then remember, this is a three-dimensional object that got sliced in half and that got, you know, flipped around. So um, that's why it, it's, you know, looking like that. And then again, from the posterior view, or I guess this is the, the posterior side of the heart, but we're looking at it from an anterior perspective. This is the left ventricle, and that is the right ventricle, and there's the IV septum. Okay. And then again, right here, you can see that's a chordae tendinae that attaches to a papillary muscle. Let me elevate this up so you can see it a little better. Okay. Chordae tendinae, mitral valve, papillary muscle. It's the elbows trabeculae carniae in the inside. Remember the shiny, the glossy layer, that's the uh, endocardium. And then remember the aorta is more on the posterior side, so it makes sense that we see the aorta better in the aortic valve right here. So there's uh, one of the cusps of the aortic valve um, as we speak there. And notice again what I was saying about the thickness of the uh, aorta. It's got a very, very thick uh, muscle tissue. And then again on the flip side, if we look at the right ventricle, you can see there are, sorry, it's a little blurry, there are tri, there's the tricuspid valve uh, with chordae tendinae, papillary muscles, trabeculae carniae. There's part of the right atrium that's been cut open right there. Then again, if we go down to this again, thicker lateral side, thinner lateral side, right, left. So again, if we open up the right ventricle here, you can see part of the tricuspid valve and the cords. If we look at the left ventricle here, you can see the chordae tendinae, the mitral valve. Um, again, there's part of the aortic valve right there, because remember, this is the posterior, the, the back side of the heart. There's the aorta, all right? There's the apex, the IV septum, papillary muscle. And here's the anterior side that we just flipped around so we can see it from the inside. Again, thicker, thinner, left, right. So again, 
right ventricle, left ventricle, a little bit of the mitral valve still intact. You can see there's a little bit of the tricuspid valve right there. Okay, a um, little bit of it there, and then the IV septum and the trabeculae carnea and so on. So, um, so yeah. So I don't know. Those are just kind of some tips and tricks to help you understand cardiac anatomy better. Now, also, remember how I said that the pulmonary trunk is more on the anterior side, right? So basically, if you see right there, it might be hard to tell. But if you see how I'm kind of poking up against that right there, that's the pulmonary trunk. Because remember, the right ventricle ejects blood into the pulmonary trunk. And remember, the pulmonary trunk is anterior to the aorta itself. Okay, so let's see, I'm actually touching the probe right there. So therefore, this actually had to go through the pulmonary valve to actually get into the pulmonary trunk right there. If you can see me poking it right there. All right. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I hope you folks find this helpful. Um, like I said, this is just kind of a quick overview of the uh, cardiac dissections. Like I said, I've got um, you know other more comprehensive videos where I cover this stuff with a lot more depth. But like I said, I just want to try to bring the essence of the lab to you guys um, who cannot be in lab. Um, and you know, again, you know, whether you're my student or anybody, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. And again, hope you found this helpful. And uh, good luck. Oops, I took that off wrong.